Sure. Oh, Nicole, we were bragging about you an hour ago. I'm here. <laughs> Love the shirt. Thank you. Had to represent uh, some way. So for those of you who missed us bragging about it earlier, one of the things we talked about that we feel that makes uh, GrimCon so special is over in track two are all of the new speakers who uh, get paired with coaches and get help with their research, their presentations, getting over that imposter syndrome, all the different things you could ever worry about, we help with that. And Nicole was one of our first new speakers ever and has now graduated not only to giving a talk at SANS, um, but is back here in the elite expert track. Yes, the first GrimCon was my first talk ever. So oh. I'm really excited. I've come that's a long awesome. way. And I think I, that's so awesome, of course. And you've already gone on and like I said, and um, given talks at other conferences and really established to put your fingerprint on the community. Yeah, and I, I honestly, I think I have uh, the coaches that I had in the first GrimCon and the second GrimCon and they just had really great advice and and really great um they were just really warm and welcoming and uh just boosted my confidence um so i, I really fell in love with uh giving back uh with my research well we look forward to uh oh, i gotta make you presenter you're already a presenter um so we look forward to your talk on the cognitive stairways of analysis Am I sharing the right screen? You are. You are up. <laughs> All right, you are good. Sure. <laughs> I love the colors, blue, red, and purple. I'm assuming that's not an accident. Um, no, actually, I already had the colors from my um, framework that I created, and then I just kind of wanted to match that. But then it was perfect because it's uh, it's very unicorny. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer unicornish as opposed to unicorny. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll take it away. Thanks. So uh, once again, I'm Nicole Hoffman, and I'm going to be presenting the cognitive stairways of analysis. So a few months ago, I really wanted to uh, give a present or I wanted to write a blog post about analysis and what it really means. Um, and when I started researching, something kind of unexpected happened. I so I want to take you on a journey of how I unintentionally created my own analytic framework. So a little bit more about me. I am currently a, an intelligence analyst at GroupSense, which is a digital risk protection company. I just finished my bachelor's this month in information technology, and I have a minor in cybersecurity. I'm Security Plus certified. I currently own and maintain a blog. Um, it's accessible at threathuntergirl.com. Uh, it's been a while since I posted though, but stay tuned. Um, my passions in information security lie um, in analysis, threat hunting, and risk management, and of course, research. Outside of work, I'm a mother of two and a huge comic book fan, as you might notice. Um, some honorable mentions are DC, Marvel, Dark Horse, and uh, Terminal Lance. So I'm gonna begin my presentation by discussing the topic of analysis and going over some of the challenges that I faced uh, when I started out as an analyst that kind of led me to pursue additional information. And then I'm going to go over six analytic models from other industries. And I'm going to discuss the key takeaways from each that I used to unintentionally create my own analytic framework, which is the cognitive stairways of analysis. Currently, there are three stairways and I'm going to be presenting each one uh, within this presentation. And then I'm going to conclude with some additional resources and helpful information. So what is analysis? We see this term all the time, but what does it really mean? How do you analyze data? Well, unfortunately, when I started out in InfoSec, this is something I had to figure out on my own. And I kind of assumed, okay, well, you look at the data and you come to some kind of conclusion. And that worked for me for a long time, but I've come a long way since that day, so I thought, well, I could take a deep dive into this topic and a blog post should be easy peasy. Uh, 
I could grab a couple frameworks and put it together and give a little step-by-step -step process on, on how to do it. Well, when I started my research, I wasn't really happy with the results. I felt like a lot of life cycles and uh, processes just name analysis as a step, but they don't necessarily break it down into additional steps. And so it's almost like we as a community are like assuming that everybody has the same definition of analysis. And so I thought maybe because I'm specifically searching in the cyber realm, maybe I'm limiting my results. So I decided like my uh, previous talk where I took lessons from a fraud, I decided to why not take lessons from other industries specifically about analysis. So my research began with a white paper um, and this white paper is titled A Cognitive Interpretation of Data Analysis by Garrett Grohlman and Hadley Wickham. Uh, this white paper compares the process of data analysis to the process of sense making. And sense making is basically how our brains make sense of the world around us. More specifically, our brain creates cognitive structures that um, represent certain aspects of reality. Um, and these uh, structures or uh, mental models uh, or schemas for sense making, they contain a wide range of information about a specific object or topic. So when we experience a new event, our brain attempts to find a relevant schema. And if it can't find one, then it could do one of three things. It can either update an existing schema, create a new schema, or determine the observation is untrustworthy, as untrustworthy and just throw it out. So for example, the first time that you experience a rainstorm, your brain might not understand what's going on and it's trying to make sense of it. Um, so it might collect some information about the rainstorm and then create an, a new schema and call it rainstorm. So the next time you experience a rainstorm, you'll know how to, you'll, your brain will know how uh, to make sense of it because you already have a schema. But let's say this new rainstorm has lightning and thunder. Well, it still fits with the schema of rainstorm, but it needs to be updated with additional information that could occur so you can understand it. So I just thought this was incredibly interesting and it kind of defines to me like what analysis really is. Um, and then the authors uh, applied this model to exploratory and confirmatory analysis. Exploratory analysis is where it, it begins with a data set with no preconceived assumptions or hypotheses about the data. And then you would try to uh, create one by exploring the data. So for example, when my computer is super laggy, I usually, try to determine the cause. And it usually takes me about 10 minutes to figure out it's a Windows update. On the other hand, confirmatory analysis, it begins with a hypothesis or a schema in sense making, and then it, you attempt to find relevant data to validate that hypothesis or schema. So for example, when other people's Windows computers are laggy, they probably immediately come to the conclusion it could be an update update. So then they could check their updates and then con confirm and validate their hypothesis. So my key takeaway from this um, process was the exploratory and confirmatory analysis. The next model that I want to go over is Dr. Christopher Chatfield's statistical investigation process. And this was published in his book and it's titled Problem Solving, A Statistician's Guide. And this model is pretty straightforward, um, but the main thing that I was really interested in that, that drew me in when I first uh, found it was step three, which is assess the structure and quality of the data or clean the data. And this is something that I have experience doing when I um, am querying large databases, but it, it can be used for, for smaller databases as well, or you know only a few variables. But I decided that for me, I actually split this into two steps. Um, so I, I split it into two key takeaways. The first one is a quality of information check. And this is where you would uh, determine the completeness of the data and 
um, really check the quality of like the sources specifically, like if you're doing open source intelligence and you're trying to collect data from, you know, open sources, sometimes you're going to get something that you're just not that comfortable with. And so this is a great way to, to, to check that. And, and if you see any knowledge gaps or something you're just not comfortable with, you can go out and, and get more data. Cleaning the data on the other hand is like data normalization, which is where you get rid of duplicates, you kind of make sure everything is in like a common taxonomy and you get rid of you know, all the stuff that you don't need that's just gonna cloud up your analysis. The second thing that I thought was really interesting about this uh, investigation process was under the select stage, I felt like this sub process took like an exploratory approach to analysis. It begins with a data set, um, they look at the data and then formulate a model. And the author specifically states the way that he does this is something called regression analysis. And regression analysis is where you have two or more variables that you're trying to find a relationship between or like an underlying structure. So for example, if you remember back in grade school, we used to get those uh, number patterns similar to this, two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. If you, and it says find the pattern that is in this uh, set of numbers. If you have one like this, it's, you could probably immediately come to the conclusion that it's just adding two each time. And however, if you have something like 28, 20, 13, 7, 2, you may need to explore your options to determine the relationship between these numbers. To me, this is sometimes a cyclical process because you're not always going to create, or you're not always going to have the right hypothesis on the first time. You might say, okay, well, 28 minus 8 is, uh, or 28 minus 20 is 8. Okay, so maybe it's subtracting 8 each time. Well, no, that doesn't fit. So the data doesn't fit my model, so I'd have to create a new one. So I could, you know, then assume maybe it's being subtracted by one each time, and then I can check the fit of that data to uh, my model. And that's kind of the process that's going. So I took regression analysis as a key takeaway because I just thought that was really interesting. It kind of expanded upon the idea of exploratory analysis. The next model um, is the model of operation of police operational intelligence analysis. And I got this one from a white paper as well. And it's titled How Analysts Think, Think Steps as a Tool for Structuring, Sensemaking, and Criminal Intelligence Analysis. I don't want to butcher the names, but I did list them. <laughs> um, this is one of the favorite, my favorite um, analysis models that I found specifically because it breaks this uh, step of analysis into additional steps, which is really interesting. So this process begins with a briefing from an investigator. Uh, the criminal analyst would then establish think steps. Think steps provide a template that enable an analyst to approach the case, decompose it into separate elements and classify associated data accordingly. And then they could do some, uh, they could request some information, do some background research, structure the data before querying the database and schematizing the data, and then trying to recreate the path of the criminal and then communicating the results. So in other words, the criminal analysts are attempting to choose a schema or multiple schemas to match the data to. And for a criminal analyst, the schemas are crimes such as murder, burglary, and human trafficking. Each crime has its own set of think steps. And in information security, each type of malware or cyber attack is going to have its own set of think steps associated with their analysis. So my key takeaway is think steps. And I honestly think that this is one of the best pieces of analytical advice I've ever received. And if you could take anything away from this presentation, I hope that it can be think steps because it could save us a lot of time and assist in training as well. This model is from an article titled The Business Analytic Model Lifecycle and it's by Michael Coveney and there's a lot of different models that I found in business analysis but I really liked this one because it reminded me of um, Step three and four kind of reminded me of the process of sense making, how you're modeling the data and then adapting the model. 
And then it kind of reminded me, um, step six kind of reminded me of um, cybersecurity policy, like uh, when you're trying to monitor the performance of a policy. So for example, so let's say you, um, you're a policymaker and you believe that the only way that you can get malware is from a phishing email. And so that's kind of inside your cognitive schema, you believe the cause of malware is a phishing email. Well, let's say one day you experience a malware event, but it's actually caused by a malicious toolbar that was downloaded. Well, it still fits within your schema of malware, but you just need to adapt your model or update it. Um, and then you can use that model for planning, or you can update any cybersecurity policies or security controls based on your updated cognitive model. And then you can monitor the performance. Um, and depending on your organization, an analyst isn't always going to be the one monitoring the performance of a control or security policy or even writing them. So I didn't end up taking this away for, for my framework, but I thought it was an honorable mention for those of you that are creating and determining the effectiveness of cybersecurity policies. My key takeaway was actually step one, which is define what is being investigated. And I took this away as determining the scope. And I know a lot of other models have a similar step, but I think it was because this one used the word define. It kind of reminded me of threat hunting. And when you're threat hunting, you have to define a specific goal or hypotheses. Otherwise, if you're too broad, you'll have too much data. And if you're if you just don't set a scope at all, then you could just, you know, chase the shiny things and, and nobody has time for that. So I started my career actually in the medical field before hopping into um, financial and then into InfoSec. So I wanted to uh, include a medical model. I thought it would be really interesting and I thought I had a lot of um, assumptions on what it would look like and how it could be similar to the process of sense making. And this particular model, I f um, it's called the medical diagnostic process model and it's from a textbook called Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare, and I listed the uh, all of the authors below. Um, this was the first model that took a cyclical approach to collection and to the collection and analysis phase that I uh, found. And um, this phase also includes, uh, you know, collecting information from the patient and then being able to um, uh, translate that into medical terminology and then creating a working diagnosis. One of the more exciting elements though about this model is that the uh, doctors get to do a physical examination of a patient and they can collect as much information as they want verbally, but the uh, physical examination is going to provide a plethora of information that they just wouldn't otherwise be able to obtain. And InfoSec is really no different. Um, if you're a managed service provider and, and you get a case from a client, you only get like a small screenshot. And so you, you don't necessarily always get the chance to do a physical examination. So this is why it's important to create the think steps so you know all the questions to ask um, so you can provide the best analysis. My key takeaway from this model was actually the communication of the diagnosis. Um, I thought the the way that intelligence analysts, excuse me, um, communicate our findings, um, it's more than just explaining, it is a communication. And sometimes um, I have to communicate my findings to multiple people with varying levels of technical knowledge, um, similar to a doctor. So I thought that was really interesting. So I took that away from this model. So I'm a huge fan of meteorology. When I was little, um, I actually wanted to be a meteorologist, but then I found out I'm really, really, really bad at math. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of math in uh, meteorology. Um, so I, I had to kind of squeeze in a model from this uh, field. So the model I found is from a white paper and it's called Optimization of a Heterogeneous Simulations uh, Workflow. And I listed the authors again. Um, the process is actually a workflow 
and not you know, an analytic process, but it kind of gives us a glimpse of the type of analysis that occurs in the forecasting process. Um, my key takeaway was actually the first step, which I thought was really interesting because this is the first model that I saw that uh, establishes an environment, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, because in information security, you know, when we're about to, when we get a case or, you know, we have to do some kind of analysis, we have to understand, you know, where the problem exists. Um, you know, for example, if, you know, Becky in accounting is experiencing um, a phishing email attack, you don't necessarily want to, you know, collect email headers from the CEO. That's not going to go over well. So. I feel like this kind of expands upon determining the scope. Um, so I think it's really interesting. The other thing that I thought was really interesting that's not necessarily a key takeaway is the subjective interpretation by a meteorologist. I feel like this is kind of an additional layer of confirmatory analysis with like another set of eyes. And I thought that was really interesting and something that could potentially be useful in a, another stairway in the future. Um, and so yeah, so I just love that. So throughout my research, I learned so much and found so many great models. Um, but I kind of felt like when I was done that I was left wanting more. And I felt like the puzzle was incomplete. And so I thought, well, what if I take away all of my favorite parts and kind of just put them in like a list from my blog post so that people can see like all the great ones. But then I decided, well, why not just make it a step-by-step -step process? And then I realized, did I just create my own framework or you know, process? And so of course I had to give it a name. So I named it the Cognitive Stairways of Analysis. And when I say stairway, I'm merely just relating a step-by-step -step process to a stairway. And there are some optionable or optional cycles in the stairway, but there's always going to be an end goal, which is dissemination. And there are currently, like I said, three stairways based on certain starting points that you might experience in information security. Um, I'm hoping to create additional uh, stairways in the future, and I implore others to contribute to this framework. Um, my original goal was to have um, all this information available on GitHub, but then I realized GitHub's kind of a alert. There's kind of a learning curve with GitHub, so. We'll see what happens with that. But I do have um, all of the things that I went over as well as some additional frameworks listed in the blog post that I did end up creating. Um, so without further ado, let's just get right into it. So the first cognitive stairway um, begins with an alert. And this alert can come from a security tool or by word of mouth. But basically, you're given a potential problem to solve. Next, you need to deter de ah, determine the scope. Um, and this includes uh, you know, identifying the end goal of your analysis and understanding the environment that the problem exists in. Step three is where you can begin compiling your data once you know you know what your data sources is or are and, and where the problem exists, you can start compiling the data. And this is where you can also do that quality of information check. And this is where you're going to want to check the completeness of your data, the quality of the data, is does it look trustworthy, um, things like that. And if you see any knowledge gaps, then you might need to compile some additional data. Um, step four is where you're going to clean the data. And remember, this is um, basically data normalization. And this is where you're going to put the data into a common taxonomy. So it just makes it easier for analyzing. And when I say common taxonomy, I just mean like everything's the same. Like if you have a field that says like San Diego and there's eight people in your office and all eight of you write it differently. When you go to query a database, you might not get all of the correct fields. And it, and it doesn't really matter when you have, you know, five or six variables, but when you're analyzing, you know, hundreds or thousands of variables, it makes a huge difference. And you can end up not having a complete picture and you can have information gaps just because there's not a common taxonomy. Um, this is also the time to get rid of all the data you don't need. If there's any additional data um, 
that's just clouding up your analysis, just get rid of it because uh, you, you want it to be as clean as possible so that it makes the analysis better. Step five is where you could begin your exploratory data analysis or EDA. Um, everyone kind of does this differently um, and it really depends on what the problem is and what the data looks like. This could be looking at a spread, putting the data in a spreadsheet. It could be looking through logs, um, or you know, you could also visualize the data. How, whatever helps you explore the data the best. And this is also the time for regression analysis. And this is where you're trying to find, as you're exploring the data, you're trying to find an underlying structure or relationship between the variables. And then step six, you can create your or generate your hypothesis or multiple hypotheses and create think steps for each one. And remember, um, the think steps, they're a template that uh, enables the analyst to approach the case, decompose it into separate elements, and then classify the data accordingly because you're trying to match the data to your hypothesis or schema. And then Step seven is confirmatory analysis, and that's where you're fitting the model to your hypothesis with your think steps. And if you find any discrepancies that, um, that don't fit either with the model or the, or the data, you can optionally go back to uh, exploratory analysis and continue searching for anything you might have missed and then generate a new hypothesis with think steps or just update your hypothesis. Uh, it really just depends on the data and the issue. And then after you confirm uh, your findings, you can move on to dissemination. And dissemination is really the most important step in the stairway because if you if you don't have it, otherwise your, all of your analysis was for nothing. And the dissemination can be in the form of written or oral communication. So the second stairway of analysis begins with a brainstorming session. And this could be that you're, um, it could be an organized event that you're brainstorming or that you decide to brainstorm and create hypotheses, maybe before a hunt, um, or this is also the time um, if like if your CISO or manager ever asks you like, hey, I saw this new threat or exploit on the news, do you think we're susceptible to it? Well, this is the stairway for those scenarios as well, because most likely you're going to have to do some form of brainstorming to try to determine the likelihood that that uh, could affect you. And if you do think you're susceptible, you know, that that's when you can generate hypotheses or a single hypothesis and then generate those think steps. And remember, those are the template that help you classify the case. And then you can determine the scope of the investigation and you can determine, um, this includes understanding the environment and setting an end goal. That's sp specific. And step three is the key assumptions check or KAC for short. And the key assumptions check um, this is an analysis technique where you can write down all of your assumptions about any given uh, topic to determine the likelihood that the, your assumptions are true or not true. And this is a great way to flush out any biases that you may have about a, a specific topic or, or your hypothesis. Uh, this is also a great time for devil's advocate, which is another uh, analysis technique where you try to attempt or you I'm talking too fast for my brain. <laughs> you attempt to think of uh, any possible alternatives to the topic um, and anything that uh, would would uh, go against it, and then you and you try and uh, determine that. Step four is um, again compiling the data. Once you know what your data sources are, you've flushed out all your biases, and then you can check the quality of your data as well as the data sources. Um, to make sure that you're really comfortable and confident with your findings. And then you can clean the data, uh, omit anything that's useless, get rid of duplicates, common taxonomy. And then the uh, stairway can go one of two ways. Because you already generated your hypothesis and think steps, you don't have to explore the data. However, 
Some people like to do this. I know I personally do. I like to just make sure that I didn't miss anything. And this is really a case by case basis. Sometimes um, you uh, will just know uh, that you don't need to explore it. And so I put that in there as an option. Um, in the event that you find something during your exploratory analysis and regression analysis, you can go back optionally to um, step one and generate a new hypothesis, a hypothesis or um, you can just update it if you need to. And then you can either go back through the steps if you need to, or you can just go straight on to step seven, which is confirmatory analysis. And this is where you're validating uh, your hypothesis. And then step eight, of course, is dissemination. So cognitive stairway number three um, is similar to the first two, but it begins a little bit differently. So it can actually begin in two different ways. The first one is it can begin by determining the scope of a red team analysis, or it can begin straight with the red team analysis without determining the scope. And a red team analysis is basically where you put yourself in the attacker's shoes and try to, um, when you're looking at a problem, you put yourself in the attacker's shoes, and which kind of leads you to a hypothesis of how you would approach this, this uh, situation. And sometimes it might be, you know, you're, you're wanting to look at, uh, you know, how vulnerable a certain asset is in your environment. And this is kind of when you would determine the scope ahead of time before you do the red team analysis. But sometimes you're just, you know, browsing your environment and you see something that you're just not comfortable with and you think, hmm, I wonder if I can exploit that. Um, and if you're in information security long enough, it happens more times than not. Um, but, and then, um, after you do the red team analysis, you can then generate your hypothesis and your think steps and compile the data that you need and then do that quality of information check as well as check the quality of your sources, clean the data, get rid of the useless data, and then optionally, just like in the stairway number two, you can explore the data to look for any discrepancies that you didn't think about um, during your red team analysis. And then you can move on to step uh, seven, which is the confirmatory analysis where you're uh, confirming and validating your hypothesis to your data. Um, and then, of course, in the step eight is dissemination. So I went over a lot of different terms, so I included a glossary of terms, and I'm going to make my um, slides available after the talk, and of course, my resources. And I did, of course, uh, like I said, I did look through a lot more um, analysis models and processes that I included in my model or my blog, um, which I have available. So I really hope that you guys liked my presentation. I hope that the cognitive stairways can assist other analysts when they're analyzing data. And again, right now there's only three, but I'm hoping to expand uh, this framework into additional um, Stairways, maybe doing like an OSIT specific, maybe doing an incident response one. There's so many ideas. Um, so I implore others to help out and uh, contribute to the framework. So you just mentioned a couple of verticals that you plan on expanding this into. Um, I think that's a really neat to kind of take what is a broad framework of um, intellectual analytics and now start to figure out, well, how do I apply them specifically in particular technical verticals? Yes, and I think specifically, like, um, if I did like an incident response specific and not necessarily like an intelligence one, like I, I modeled mine, I could do, I can add in like the treatment plan from the you know, medical one or the monitoring the model performance or even creating a, um, you know, a cybersecurity policy one for that process. And I think that ties back to Catherine's talk where she was coming up with different ways for us to talk to the non-technical crowd is, uh, I mean, that's a core component of that. And these different frameworks are also a different way to look at that information from that, those different and then shared perspectives. Yes, that's very true. And I actually thought about if I'm breaking down the steps of analysis, why not uh, also break down the step of dissemination? and how you know it could you could not only uh, disseminate to different teams in your with internally but also externally and you know executives versus technical and stuff like that so that's gives me a great idea 
And I think the dissemination point is probably the most critical point in the way we frame that or how we communicate that uh, takes all those other steps. And that's the, the key reason that we're actually doing the analysis, right? Exactly. That's the most important step. Otherwise, all of your analysis is kind of useless or, I mean, it's always practice, but you always want to have those actionable results. That was very are there well done. Tools, are there, are there tools that you recommend that help underpin this? Um, I think it really depends. I, I, I wanted to make it really broad so that a number of different uh, individuals in InfoSec can use it. So it's not super specific, but I'm hoping in the future to kind of make it a little bit more specific. Um, but if there's any questions about anything, like any specific step, and you're wondering how to do it, if you're looking for tools, I, I'm sure I can answer them. Um, my go-to is Excel because it's the mother of all tools. <laughs> Excel is the most common security tool everywhere. It is. It's the best thing. I love it. <laughs> There's nothing it can't do. Followed by PowerPoint and then Microsoft Word. It's true. It's very true. The the Microsoft Word for those of you at home was a uh, is the fact you have to write a report. Yes. The dissemination of information. The most critical part. <laughs> Ex exactly. Yes. That and yes. And it keeps making me think maybe I should break that down into an additional thing, but I could talk about this forever. <laughs> it's very useful. There's a lot there. And I think if you continue this work, like there's a lot that can be gained from it. Yeah. So how does it, how, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I, I hope it could be useful. So how does, uh, how does your current workplace look at uh, these uh, cognitive steps? Um, I mean, I think um, they're they're being introduced to the cognitive steps during <laughs> during this presentation as well. They're all watching, so I'm hoping we can apply them um, to our own intelligence analysis. And a lot of the uh, the ways that I applied the 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 processes that I I researched is it has to do with my own personal experiences. So. Um, I think it definitely helps me every day. I actually have the cognitive stairways on my wall um, when I'm going through a process. I want to make sure I'm not forgetting a step or flushing out those biases and stuff like that. So How did you full color program? poster print is what you're saying you're going to come out with next? <laughs> that would actually be really cool. Um, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> I already have stickers on my on my uh, website, so maybe I'll do uh, prints or something. Maybe if I get 12, we can do a calendar. <laughs> I like it. So how did you first start down this path? I mean, what was the catalyst that, where you were like, you know, this is something I need to codify? So I, I started with a, I just wanted to do a blog post and I thought, well, um, I had a couple different topics and I'm like, well, let's just do a deep dive into analysis because I just, I kept seeing analysis as a step in different frameworks and processes. And I thought, you know, why not break it down? And I thought it would be easy to do. I thought it'd be, oh, just, you know, grab a couple frameworks and be done. Um, and that just wasn't the case. And then, you know, after I found all of the specific types of analysis and I made the list, I thought, well, instead of just making a list, why not make it a process and put them in order? And then I was like, did I just create a framework? <laughs> and so it was completely unintentional, um, but I'm really, really, really proud of the results. Well, again, congratulations on uh, graduating with your bachelor's degree, but I'd like to point out that a lot of the work that you're doing here leads directly into a thesis. Yes, actually. Um, this is <laughs> this is, may or may not be a part of that said thesis. <laughs> oh, you've got other ideas? Maybe. Um, I know I'm not. I'm done with school, but um, I have some additional ideas as far as publications and and so forth. All right, Nicole. Well, we look forward to reading the book when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. I'll send you the first copy. <laughs> I like this. You've got all the way from this is the first talk I've ever given, and that was uh, at the in the spring. To mm -hmm. now, we're we're at the cusp of writing and publishing a book. Yes, 
And I have Grimcon to thank. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm glad that we have been a part of your journey uh, on uh, your professional career development. And if you do really uh, write a book and uh, us egging you on helps make that happen, then we are more than happy to do it. Yes. Well, I could say without a doubt that uh, Grimcon has made 2020 a lot brighter for a lot of people. Thank you. That's, uh, I think, the best compliment we can get. So the question we've been asking all of our uh, guests today has been predictions for 2021. And the one on everyone's mind always is, at the as we do these end of years, is what do you think is going to be a change in the threat landscape in 2021? Um, well, I mean, after uh, you know that release of the source code of Cobalt Strike, uh, I definitely see a huge surge in ransomware, and I think that's that's only going to pick up speed. I think that they're going to continue to get more creative, and it's going to be a massive problem that we're going to have to deal with. Um, so I think that is going to continue to be the number one threat in 2021. Tyler, that sounds a lot like what you were saying earlier. Yeah, that is that's very similar, and I I don't think you're you're far off. Uh, and not just Cobalt Strike, right? Like Cobalt Strike's a yeah. Java application; it's been reversed several times. Like the year of the C2 was last year, and that was a a large amount of of good frameworks that have very similar capabilities. So uh, the ease of being able to be a semi-sophisticated adversary. Uh, with commodity tools is is now, so it will become much more prevalent, and they will be abused moving forward. Like we've seen, uh, I think the gap between the script kitty and the um, sophisticated adversary is going to become bigger, and the gap between companies doing security right and companies that are getting left behind is going to be greater and greater. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I, those I hope you haven't that we seen can start it. doing it the right way. Uh, George and I, um, coming from a lunch conversation uh, at the last DerbyCon, um, we pushed out an, a, a concept called uh, the C2 Matrix, um, the C2Matrix.com, and we wanted a compendium to catalog all of the C2s that were publicly available, whether they are purchasable or whether they're open source. And when we first started, we initially had a list of 23 of them, and we're over 60 now. That's how many are out there and available. And uh, to help folks at home, we also provide a decision matrix on how to use which ones for certain purposes. Um, there are defensive components there, so we are uh, generating artifacts to be able to defend against them. And then we also include a couple of uh, VMs that already have a lot of these things installed, so you can get started from day one because uh, some of them, the first challenge is just getting the thing to actually install the package. That's pretty awesome. I think that's highly that useful really from, awesome. from a tracking standpoint and just keeping it up. Like, I thought I knew a lot of them, and I get on that list, and there's some. I'm like, when did that come out, and how did they, when did they get that capability? Like, there's a continual adaptation, and there's a lot of groups pushing stuff. So, yeah, a lot of innovation happening in the community there, um, and so it's been really interesting also seeing which languages become popular and watching those grow and. We're not even talking about like a, a, a multi-year view here. This is a one-year view, seeing the shift in the conversation, where the innovation is coming, what new frameworks are coming to the table, and why they're coming to the table. All tying back to your prediction there, Nicole, which is I think that um, commoditized, um, available uh, offensive tooling is going to um, continue to uh, be seen quite a lot. Definitely. Yeah, I think that there's, um, you know that it's a huge threat when someone that has no technical, um, they're not in the technical field, everybody that you that I can talk to, all my neighbors, they all know what ransomware is. <laughs> and so that's kind of how you know that it's it's a definitely uh, a big threat. Yes, it is. I think it's going to be an interesting 2021. 2020 was a sucky year, but there was a lot of uh, things that happened. So it kind of sets up a an interesting dichotomy for 2021. Have you ever walked into a year and been like, this is going to be the boring year? Nobody ever comes in like, well, this year, 
it, what's going to be different about it is nothing's going to happen. It's going to be boring. It's going to be calm, <laughs> going to be peaceful. There are going to be no surprises. I don't know if you that's 2021, like that? buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's never going to be the case. No, this is true, especially in the age we live. <laughs> But that's all the all the more important to get your analysis right, and I think the the framework that that you just uh, kind of displayed is a great, especially for those that have analytical minds, which is a lot of us, uh, having that kind of framework to follow and really breaking down the pie in the sky. It's always better to uh, keep breaking those components down. Yeah, it's just analysis, but what happens in analysis? How do you do analysis right? Like those components, that's a uh, that's something I haven't seen a lot of, and I think that's really really cool that you did that. Thank you. All right. Well, Nicole, great to see you again. As always, thanks for having me. I'm honored. And uh, thank you for your uh, kind compliments on uh, GrimCon for the year. Uh, we wish you a wonderful 2021, which, according to Tyler, is going to be easy and boring. Yes, super boring. <laughs> yeah. To a GrimCon 4, we'll see you. <laughs> Bye.